Hello everybody, this is Steve the Tour Guide. Welcome back to my channel. And today's episode is called Biden's Cognitive Dissonance. And I'll let the clips that follow explain exactly why I've named the episode so. And I'll let Lindsey Graham in the final clip actually address some of that cognitive dissonance. So go ahead, watch these clips. We also have to remember that Hamas does not represent, let me say it again, Hamas does not represent the vast majority of the Palestinian people on the Gaza Strip or anywhere else. Let me be also very clear, as I have said before, we cannot conflate Hamas with the Palestinian people. In my meetings today with the Prime Minister and senior Israeli officials, I made clear that before Israel resumes major military operations, it must put in place humanitarian civilian protection plans that minimize further casualties of innocent Palestinians. But Israel has the most sophisticated, one of the most sophisticated militaries in the world. It is capable of neutralizing the threat posed by Hamas while minimizing harm to innocent men, women, and children. And it has an obligation to do that. President Biden and I have also been clear with the Israeli government in public and in private many times. As Israel defends itself, it matters how. The United States is unequivocal. International humanitarian law must be respected. Too many innocent Palestinians have been killed. You see, in this kind of a fight, the center of gravity is the civilian population. And if you drive them into the arms of the enemy, you replace a tactical victory with a strategic defeat. So I have repeatedly made clear to Israel's leaders that protecting Palestinian civilians in Gaza is both a moral responsibility and a strategic imperative. And so I want to go back to what you alluded to, which is what the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said yesterday. He said, if you drive civilians into the arms of the enemy, you replace a tactical victory with a strategic <laughs> defeat, which he's saying that civilian casualties yeah. could create even more enemies. Yeah. Does he have a point? Uh, the, well, well, no, he's so naive. I mean, I've just lost all confidence in this guy. How about focusing on protecting our soldiers, men and women in Syria and Iraq? A strategic defeat would be inflaming the Palestinians. They're already inflamed. They're taught from the time they're born to hate the Jews and to kill them. They're taught math by if you had 10 Jews, you kill six. How many would you have left? It's like this is a tranquil population only inflamed after Israel goes in to defend itself. It's really naive. This is a radicalized population. I don't want to kill innocent people, but Israel is fighting not just Hamas, but the infrastructure around Hamas. Look what happened to the Israeli hostages when they were presented to the Palestinian population. It's beyond naive. Strategic failure is letting Hamas stand. Cognitive dissonance is a mental conflict that occurs when your beliefs don't line up with your actions. It's an uncomfortable state of mind when someone has contradictory values, attitudes, or perspectives about the same thing. Now, each of the declarations of each of these individual representatives of Joe Biden's administration have pledged to support Israel, and what they admit is a war for the very existence of Israel. In fact, I just heard a general on television correctly refer to this war as to be or not to be, which is to say it's for Israel to either be as a state, to continue as a state, or to not be, to cease to be a state. That's how serious this war is. It is a war for Israel's very existence. And yet, every one of those pledges was then followed by the word but, and then modified by each of the declarations that you just heard. And each of these revealing the extent to which the Biden administration is deceived on so many levels. Firstly, with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris insisting that we not conflate Hamas or its goals with the sentiments of the majority of the Palestinians, which often referred to as the Arab street or Palestinian street, and their goals. According to uh, the Biden administration, most Palestinians want to live in peaceful coexistence with Israel and always have. 
And it's only Hamas that has hijacked these dreams and, uh, and basically have destroyed their ability to be implemented. And that's simply not true. Now, in other videos that I've shared on this channel, I've mentioned that on the eve of this current war, something like 75% of the Palestinians in Gaza, but also, uh, let's say, combined with the West Bank, roughly 70 to 75% of these Palestinians supported Hamas. In fact, one of the reasons why elections have not been held on the West Bank, which is currently ruled by the Palestinian Authority and its leader, Mahmoud Abbas, is because just like in 2005 and six, the Palestinian Authority would lose in a popular election. It would lose the popular vote to Hamas. And that's exactly what happened in Gaza. Hamas came to power through democratic elections. Now, it solidified the results by lobbying the Palestinian Authority officials of the Gaza Strip from uh, high towers down to their desks below. Now, if a vote were to be held in the West Bank, the same thing would happen. Now, since the war started, polls have been taken. And by the way, these aren't polls taken by American or British uh, pollsters. These are polls taken by the Palestinians themselves. Okay, you can Google Berzate University poll, and I'll, I, I have a copy of it, and I would try to attach it to this video when I upload it to YouTube. Polls show that since the attacks on October 7th, roughly 75% of the Palestinians approve of Hamas's attacks on October 7th. So cognitive dissonance number one. Thus says Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Hamas does not represent the Palestinians and the Palestinians are not in league with Hamas and that's just simply not the case. And now cognitive dissonance number two, which says in the words of Anthony Blinken, that Israel can neutralize Hamas while at the same time minimizing the loss of life to the Palestinian civilians caught in the fray between the Israeli army and Hamas's fighters. Is that true? Well, mind you, none of the people who speak up on this issue, except for Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, who was answered by uh, Lindsey Graham, but all the others, none of them have any military experience. And yet, they, like backseat drivers, think that they have some secret sauce that Israel is just not knowledgeable of, of how to wage a urban campaign unlike anything we've seen since World War II and so far as the density of the battlefield, the small parameters of that battlefield, uh, that Israel could be doing so much more to mitigate the loss to Palestinian life, and that's just simply not true. The problem is, is that the majority of Americans and policymakers, as well as in England and elsewhere, have not served in the military. And therefore, they're being led by their emotions, they're being led by their heart rather than by experience, rather than by cognition. In other words, cognitive dissonance, which comes from lack of experience. Okay? Now, uh, Israel is doing all they can to preserve the lives of Palestinian civilians. Now, how do I know this? Well, First of all, I was an Israeli soldier, and I remember being told repeatedly uh, to do everything I could to avoid the loss of innocent civilians, not for their sake, but for mine, because commanders would explain that later on in life, we would be haunted as God did not create us to just simply mow people down, okay? Unless you are a psychopath or a sociopath, a person with no empathy, you can't simply kill innocent people and not pay for it later in life through your conscience. And therefore, my commanders would say, Steve, we don't kill civilians because these civilians among the Palestinians love us or ever will. We don't kill them because by killing them, we'll kill our own consciences and ruin our lives going forward as we mature and grow into adulthood after the army. So I heard uh, speeches like that when I was in the Israeli army. I also had to carry in my left 
pocket of my fatigues, a copy, a laminated copy of the Geneva Accords, and every so often was quizzed on the various articles of those Geneva Accords to make sure that I understood them. Mind you, the Palestinians and most Arab militias and armies don't carry such laminated copies of the Geneva Accords in their pockets. And lastly, I'm not sure you know this because few people do, but the Israeli defense establishment has a bunker in Tel Aviv. It's very well known in Israel, but not so known outside of Israel. And within that bunker, these wars are run. Now, the Air Force has its highest command in those bunkers, and each time it launches a sortie against an enemy, it has uh, an international law expert sitting next to the Air Force commander in that bunker in Tel Aviv. And before the final confirmation or approval is given for that sortie, permission must be received from that international law lawyer. Israel literally takes each of its sorties to one of these people. They're literally sitting next to the Air Force commanders underground in that bunker in Tel Aviv and telling them, you can hit this, but you can't hit that. If you hit this, you'll be charged for war crimes, but you can hit this. And therefore, is Israel doing everything they can? I'll tell you that they're going above and beyond what most militaries in the world do. I'm not sure even the American Air Force goes to such strides in having lawyers sit next to their Air Force commanders, advising them on what they can hit and cannot hit. And now we're going to move on, if you will, to the grand poopa of cognitive dissonance, that being the five-point plan of the Biden administration for Arab-Israeli peace and the future of the Gaza Strip at the conclusion of the current hostilities. Now, that five-point plan was highlighted or outlined by none other than Kamala Harris when she was in the United Arab Emirates this past weekend for an environmental conference on global warming. And here she went further than any representative of the Biden administration before her to delineate the five things that the Biden administration is not only looking to do following this war, but if you listen to her wording at the end of her speech here, it sounds like they want to impose this plan. Listen carefully to the Biden administration's five-point plan. Five principles guide our approach for post-conflict Gaza. No forcible displacement, no reoccupation, no siege or blockade, no reduction in territory, and no use of Gaza as a platform for terrorism. We want to see a unified Gaza and West Bank under the Palestinian Authority, and Palestinian voices and aspirations must be at the center of this work. At a certain point, the intense fighting and the phase of fighting will end, and we will begin implementing our plans for the day after. Notice how she said that they'll begin to implement their plans on the day after. Wow. Almost as if America is going to impose its will on Israel. Now, what is that will? I'm going to repeat some of the things that she said just to tell you how awful this is uh, for Israel's interest going forward as, uh, as a viable state existing in the jungle known as the Middle East, where all of its neighbors want to destroy it. So first of all, she said no occupation. Benjamin Netanyahu has said that following this war, Israel will have to occupy at least part of the Gaza Strip. It's been talking about creating a buffer zone the full length of the Gaza Strip maybe a mile wide or half a mile wide between the urban built-up area of the Gaza Strip and the border settlements and communities of Israel on its side of the border in order to prevent terror squads from crossing over the frontier like they did on October 7th. Um, well, Kamala Harris just said no to the occupation. In other words, Israel, you're not allowed to occupy any of the Gaza Strip following the conclusion of the war, no matter how long you need to do it to protect your lives and your interests. 
Then she said no siege or blockade, and she was obviously referring to Israel and Egypt, by the way. It's not just Israel. Israel and Egypt have had a naval blockade on the Gaza Strip since 2006 when Hamas came to power to prevent arms from flowing in to the territory. Now, Hamas has bypassed that naval blockade through the building of tunnels under its border with the Sinai Peninsula, through which it's received cement for its tunnels and piping for its rockets. And what can you imagine Hamas being able to do or any hostile entity in Gaza had there been no naval blockade? With a naval blockade, the worst of the worst of the weapons have been kept out of the Gazan uh, hands. Okay, and Kamala Harris is saying that in any future arrangement, no more naval blockade. Now there has to be the free flow of products into the Gaza Strip. And that, my friends, comprises another existential threat to Israel. Then she said no reduction in territory. Now this sort of overlaps with the no occupation. What she's saying is that Israel can occupy any part of the Gaza Strip in that it would reduce what already is a small territory, uh, one of the d more densely packed uh, territories on earth. And she's saying, look, even for your security, if you want to create a buffer zone, well, do it on your side of the border because you can't minimize any of the territory that currently comprises the Gaza Strip. Now, wait to get to this one. She says, the creation of a unified entity. Now, she didn't use the word state, but that's their ultimate goal. A unified entity or state comprised of the Gaza Strip combined with the West Bank under the rule of the Palestinian Authority. The same Palestinian Authority that one time ruled in Gaza until it was overthrown by the popular will of the people of Gaza and uh, their representative, Hamas. It would be similarly thrown out of rule in the West Bank, as I said earlier in the video, if elections were held in the West Bank, and it will be similarly deposed in the Gaza Strip should it ever try to take the reins of power again. And that's because even though the Palestinian Authority, like Hamas, wants to eliminate Israel, the Palestinians consider it to be a corrupt organization. Much of the money that it is received by international organizations for the betterment of the citizens of these Palestinian territories has been pocketed by the rulers of the Palestinian Authority, though much could be said for Hamas as well. Okay, And then lastly, and here's the grand conclusion of all this, Palestinian voices and aspirations must be at the center of this work, according to Kamala Harris. Not Israel's vital interest, but Palestinians' aspirations and voices must be at the center of this work. And that, my friends, spells out the total betrayal of Israel. Unless they're speaking out of both sides of their mouths, what you just heard was Kamala Harris betraying entirely Israel's vital interest to go forward and to exist in the future in a sea of enemies committed to its destruction. And uh, that's the Biden administration's gambit. And uh, I had a video entitled Biden's Gambit. So you could say that this is that gambit now expressed in more detail. Thanks for joining me and choosing to spend your time with me for this update. This is Steve, the tour guide, signing off. Be blessed, be vigilant, and see you the next time for the continuation of our study of the book of Ezra. Until then, shalom.